Good afternoon and welcome to our Good Friday service, An Hour at the Cross. I'm going to be leading this time together and I'll be joined by John Philpot Howard, who's going to share some reflections with us. If you've got a cross to hand, it may be a good idea to have it with you so you can use it as part of our reflection this afternoon. Maybe the palm cross that you might have been sent if you're a regular member of the Christchurch family. And just to note that many of the pictures and most of the images that are going to be shared this afternoon were taken on the Christchurch pilgrimage to the Holy Land last year. Each little section of the service will start with a Bible reading, then there'll be a reflection and then there'll be a piece of music. At the end of the fifth reflection, we'll have some silence. And during the whole time, you'll be seeing images portrayed on the screen, mostly from the Holy Land itself. So this is a chance to reflect on the events of Good Friday all those years ago and how they impact on us now. We begin with the Collect, the Church's special prayer for Good Friday. Almighty God, look with mercy on this your family for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who is alive and glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. And now our first reading. John chapter 1 verses 14 to 18, the word became flesh. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. The glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When we reflect on the events of Good Friday, we normally hold in our minds the human nature of Jesus, especially his suffering at the hands of the Romans and the religious elite. We are affected not only by the horror of the cross, 
but by the ill-treatment and mocking of an innocent and holy person. Also, of course, this week we are considering the last few days of Jesus' life on earth. But if you look back in the Gospel story, we see that Jesus has taken an extraordinary journey. His lowly birth, the years in mundane village life in Nazareth, and then the three years of public ministry in Galilee and around Jerusalem. In addition to the story of the life of Jesus, it is important to remember the broader and deeper nature of the one of whom we are speaking, as John does in this first reading. Jesus was not only a historical, itinerant teacher living in Israel. He is also the word from God, the only Son. Father Richard Raw, a well-known Catholic priest, contemplative and writer, refers to him as the Universal Christ, or the Cosmic Christ. When we think about that, Christ from the beginning of time and eternity, we have greater awe and wonder at the Holy Week and Easter story. So what does it mean when John says Jesus is the Word? Humans live by words and language, spoken and written. These attributes are what mark us out from the rest of the animal kingdom. We use words to communicate ideas about the past, present and future. In the same way, God speaks to our human existence through his word, Jesus the Universal Christ. Through him God reveals his existence his love for us, and his activity in the world. We recognise that through Jesus, God shares with us in the suffering world we find ourselves in today. This revelation has chained billions of people down the centuries. Some try to silence that revelation, as we see in the Good Friday narrative. But words once spoken cannot be silenced or taken back. And God had other plans, as we discover on Easter Day.
the second reading, John chapter 18, verses 1 to 11, the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, For whom are you looking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, For whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfil the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I spent a week in Brixton Prison once, not for any misdemeanours, but for an, an attachment to the chaplaincy. One thing that struck me was the passive nature of the prisoners, shepherded around the corridors, locked in cells, powerless and subject to the mechanisms of the law and the prison system. In the passage we just heard, Jesus appears to become passive and powerless when the soldiers, police, chief priests and Pharisees come with lanterns and torches and weapons. It looks like he is just giving himself up into their hands, which in one sense he is. But in the original Greek, the word used here is paradidomai, to give or hand over to another. In a wonderful book, The Stature of Waiting, the writer W. H. Van Stone reflects on the majesty of Jesus as he waits before those who acute, taunt and crucify him. Seemingly a passive victim, Jesus shows strength in his responses and commands. I am he, and let these men go. Or he even stays completely silent before the authorities and accusers. He is in command even in the midst of this apparent passivity, because he knows what is happening, and he trusts in his heavenly Father's plan of salvation. For us today, right now, we have an enforced passivity each day until the outbreak is over, but sometimes we need to wait, listen and accept what is happening in a godly way. Many are offering themselves up to risk and hardship in our hospitals, transport, shops, and other essential services. Whatever our circumstances, when we offer ourselves up in difficult situations, as Jesus did, we trust that God will bring us deliverance, as indeed he will. Passivity is not weakness. At the right moment it has its own strength as we wait patiently and prayerfully for the unfolding of events within God's time.
The third reading is taken from John chapter 18, verses 15 to 27. Peter denies Jesus and the high priest questions Jesus. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing round it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We see in this passage from John's Gospel a comparison between Jesus and Peter. Jesus says, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret, which of course is true. In contrast, Peter, in his moment of testing, desires to keep his identity secret until the cock crows and reminds him that he is denying his master. In a way, who can blame him? Would we be any different? Because who would want to be dragged off to the vicious authorities and face possible crucifixion for insurrection? According to data from the organisation Open Doors, many people around the world today live in societies where persecution is rife. This includes 200 million Christians, that's about 10% of all Christians, plus many from other religions too. Some are brave enough to speak out about their faith and practice it. They face social sanctions, imprisonment, or even death. In the UK, we don't have overt persecution, but sometimes we keep quiet about our faith, which we think is not exactly denying Christ like Peter did. But in a way, it is. Because if we truly believe the gospel has such value for us, people should be able to hear those words of Jesus and make up their own minds. Moreover, we need to stand up for the gospel values of truth, justice and love. If we don't, then there is a risk that evil will triumph. It was probably the philosopher John Stuart Mill who said in 1867, to paraphrase, Bad people need nothing more to achieve their ends than that good people should look on and do nothing. 
Perhaps we can resolve today always to present gospel truth and not keep it and our personal faith hidden. The fourth reading is from John chapter 18, verses 28 to 38, Jesus before Pilate. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not want, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfil what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is often said that these days we live in a post-truth society. This means that facts are less important and often denied, even if scientifically verified. 
opinions and emotions are considered more valid, especially if repeated frequently on social media. Hence we see fake news abounding all the time. My favourite at the moment, the most laughable, is the story that 5G mobile phone transmitters spread coronavirus. Pilate asks Jesus what is truth, because Jesus has just said that he came into the world to testify to the truth. So of what truth is Jesus speaking? We believe he speaks the truth about God, that God loves us and cares for us, and sent his Son into the world for our sakes. How do we know this is true? Well, we trust in the validity of the Gospel accounts and the many witnesses to his life, death and resurrection. People of the first century were not stupid. They could tell what was real or not. And we experience this truth of God ourselves in a living and valid way. Jesus revealed the truth about many things. For example, the human heart. He spoke of its sin and darkness, but also its ability for faith, love and service. He revealed the truth about the risks of religion, its tendency to be corrupted and false. And he brought to light many other truths about our world. Read one of the Gospels with a mind that asks, Is this about truth? Is it true? And we will find that it is. Often truth and falsehood are intermingled. In the passage we just heard, the religious authorities would not enter Pilate's headquarters, even as they planned a colossal injustice and indirect murder of Jesus. They wanted to avoid ritual defilement because it would mean they couldn't partake in a true religious act, the Passover meal. How could they not see the extraordinary dualism of their thinking about God and what they were actually doing to this innocent man? People can become blind to the truth. As Christians and as a church, we need to be those who search diligently for the truth about our faith. We should open our minds to the inspiration and teaching of God's Spirit given to us through Christ. We know this because Jesus told us in John 16 that the Spirit of truth will guide us into all the truth. This isn't some kind of spiritual voice from God in our heads. Because, as well as the Scriptures, God has given us insight and reason and common sense to reject what is false and discern what is true. In our so-called post-truth society, we must stand firm on the real truth.
The fifth reading is taken from John chapter 19, beginning at verse 16b and continuing to verse 42, the crucifixion of Jesus. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write, the king of the Jews. But this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfil what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots, and that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfil the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we come to the final few minutes of Jesus' life. The word finished comes twice in the reading. When Jesus knew that all was now finished. And, of course, his final words, it is finished. What is it that is finished exactly? It could be seen negatively as when people speak about a ve failed venture. I'm finished. But the sense of it is the opposite. It is accomplished. The work that the Father sent him to do has been completed. Jesus told us what his work is when he read from Isaiah in the synagogue. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Taking each of those elements of the work of Jesus helps us to realise just what the completed work of Jesus means for us today. Firstly, there is good news because we have forgiveness and also we show concern for the poor and oppressed. Secondly, God releases those held captive by sin and circumstance. Thirdly, sight is given for the spiritually blind, together with healing and wholeness. And fourthly, we understand that we are in an age of God's favour, receiving his grace with the coming of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Finally, in this passage from John, he tells us movingly how Jesus bows his head and gives up his spirit. When we come to the end of our own lives, as we surely do, will we also be able to say that we have completed the work God called us to do? What we are asked to do as individuals is, of course, between us and God. But as a church, we do the work of Christ in the world to bring the gospel of peace, justice and salvation to all. In silence, let us now think about what we do for God as we contemplate the finished work of Jesus and be thankful for what he has done for us. Let us pray to God, who alone makes us dwell in safety. For all who are affected by coronavirus, through illness or isolation or anxiety, that they may find relief and recovery. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For those who are guiding our nation at this time and shaping national policies, that they may make wise decisions. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. 
for doctors, nurses and medical researchers, that through their skill and insights many will be restored to health. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the vulnerable and the fearful, for the gravely ill and the dying, that they may know your comfort and peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. And if you have a cross there, you might like to hold it or touch it. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. This is the wood of the cross on which hung the Saviour of the world. Come, let us worship. O Saviour of the world, by who by your cross and precious blood have redeemed us, save us and help us, we humbly pray.
Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and those you love now and always. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for joining us for our Good Friday Hour at the Cross this afternoon. It's been a joy to have you with us and to share in this remembrance. Do join us again this coming Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning for our service when we celebrate the joy of the resurrection and the risen Christ. So I hope to see you then. In the meantime, have a very blessed weekend. Amen.